Thank you all for coming. I know uh, it was a really fun night last night, so I'm really glad that you guys uh, were able to make it here. Um, my name is Karen Sandler, um, and my talk is about free software on medical devices. So I start with a very basic proposition, which is that our software must be safe. And I'm going to talk today about medical devices, and this is a healthcare track, but a lot of what I'm saying here could be also said about cars, for example, or voting machines, or our financial markets, really any society critical software. Um, and I'm talking about medical devices in, um, in this talk, but it's equally as critical in each of those fields. And I really believe that as time goes on, we'll see that these issues are more and more critical. For example, um, just yesterday, there was a, a product advisory on a Boston Scientific ICD where um, what looks like is probably a software failure, and the FDA reports don't necessarily identify failures as related to software or not, but it, it pretty much looks like a software failure um, caused all these ICDs to, um, to not deliver therapy when needed. And that was 34,000 malfunctioning devices um, advised just yesterday. So, you know, if you follow these, these advisories, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a current issue and it's only increasing. I actually have a mouse and I was leaning over to push the button. Um, so I wanted to tell you my story. Um, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I work at the Software Freedom Law Center. We're a nonprofit 501c3 organization that is set up to provide legal, we're sort of like legal aid. We give um, legal advice to free software developers that are working in the public interest. A lot of our clients are nonprofit foundations. I'm an activist. The Free Software, um, the Software Freedom Law Center and the Free Software Foundation is a client, but um, sometimes people get them mixed up, <laughs> um, is, uh, is also an educational organization. And you know we go and we speak and we talk about why free software is so important. And that's why it's so funny that, like all of us, I am also a patient. But about two years ago, I found out that I had a heart condition. And, um, you know, it, actually, I found out about it almost by accident. Um, and you think, being a nonprofit lawyer and nonprofit activist, you won't be surprised to hear that my condition is that I have a big heart. I actually have a huge heart. So I've got the Grinch here. The Grinch has a heart two sizes too small. Then it grew three sizes that day. My heart is actually three sizes too big. And it's all fine. I don't have any symptoms. Um, it's, it's not really that disruptive to my life. But it turns out that I'm a, a, at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Um, and when the doctors sort of sit there and tell you you have a really high risk for sudden death, it's, it's the strangest thing because, you know, they use sudden death as a technical term as if, you know, that's a, a reasonable thing. You sort of expect them to come up with, you know, my condition is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's not called, you know, huge heart syndrome. Um, but anyway, so um, it turns out I, had a, um, I have a potentially a 2 to 3% chance of suddenly dying every year, which compounds. So looking forward to the decades that I, I hope to live, um, that did not seem very promising. Um, so the answer that I was given was that I could get a defibrillator. And then it would basically be like having people follow me around with paddles all the time. And if I went into sudden death, I would get shocked and I would be saved. So that sounded like a really good option, um, probably not being able to suddenly die. But I worked at the Software Freedom Law Center. And you know I, I know a lot about technology, and I, I know about how it fails. So um, I got really worried. Now, First off, I just got worried about having something foreign in my body, about trying to, to you know, put a piece of equipment that I didn't design and I didn't, you know, I didn't make in my body was just really, really kind of scary. And I thought about <laughs> all of these dramatic scenarios where, you know, I, I, you know, I would have wires jutting out of me and all of these really scary things. Um, and, and it really just came down to the initial fear. When you find out you need an implantable medical device, you think it's, it's going to so dramatically change your life simply because you have a piece of equipment installed connected to your heart or, or whatever you might have. But as I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. I could be enhanced. 
<laughs> um, and um, Star Trek fans, I'm sorry, but um, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan, I swear. Um, and um, you know, and I got really comfortable with the idea of, you know, I sort of thinking of the device as this really good thing that I could have in my body that I could rely on in case, you know, one of the things that I'm not supposed to do with my heart condition is I, I'm not supposed to have any burst activity. So they say all these ridiculous things. I'm a New Yorker and they say, you know, you shouldn't run for the subway. Never run for a bus. Don't run across the street. Don't do any of those things. And it's like, what? You've got to be kidding me. How can I live like that? And you know, with a device, I, I, I know that if I happen to jog across the street and it happens to be too fast, that I'll have a, a device that will kick in, and, um, and, and, and that's a relief. So I got really excited about the idea of getting a heart device um, and not being have to worry about suddenly dying anymore. But then I started to think about, well, hang on. What the heck am I putting in my body? Do I know? So I started looking into it, and I found out, I guess not surprisingly, probably to most people in the audience, but perhaps I was a little naive at the time, I found out that, of course, all of the source code on the devices was proprietary and closed and could not be examined. There's information about the devices on the FDA website. Um, the medical device companies want you to have information about some of the basic specs and the basic things of how they work, but um, the, the information they give you as a patient is comical. They say, oh, your device can be controlled just like a television remote control. That's actually in the little pamphlet that people gave me, and I, I started to really worry. So I talked to my doctors about it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so I spoke to my doctors about it, and um, that did not go well. My initial doctors did not want to hear it at all. They thought I was crazy. They said, you know, why are you worried about this issue? One electrophysiologist, or the electrophysiologist I was going to at the time said, I implant these devices into several people a day. This, there can't be this problem, you're crazy. And he wouldn't talk to me about it. And my cardiologist was also, you know, said, um, you know, Medtronic makes a lot of these devices and it's their business to make sure that they work properly. Why would you have a problem with it? And I thought about, you know, well, that's what product liability law is built on. You know, we all got Fords, we're now, now Toyotas. You know, you can't necessarily rely on the companies to tell you what's safe and what's not safe. So um, that was really troublesome. So I ditched those doctors found new doctors, they were much better, and they encouraged me to talk to the device manufacturers. Go ahead. So these are the three major device manufacturers. It's, not, it's pretty um, tight, so I'm gonna try to make time for questions at the end, so if you could keep it in mind. Um, so the, um, the, these are the three major medical device manufacturers. Um, and I went to each of them and I said, hey, I've been diagnosed with a heart condition, I've been prescribed a pacemaker defibrillator, can I see the source code on any of the devices that you might put in my body? Like, you know, this is what I think I'd be getting. Can I, can I see the source code? And I got nowhere. I mean, I got nowhere with calling their customer service, you know, patient service numbers. I got nowhere talking to their representatives. Everybody just thought I was completely crazy. It was this weird, weird instance where I was like, you're putting this software, you're connecting this software literally to my heart. And you know you, you won't even talk to me or acknowledge the fact that I might want to see it. So I you know I I actually even in my last calls offered to sign an NDA and that that also went nowhere. So um, it was really surprising. In the meanwhile, um, the Medical Device Security Center, which is a um, a research group of a few different universities working together, um, put out this study where they actually were able to hack into a pacemaker just like the one that they had prescribed to me. So they were able to um, use ordinary equipment. So it's, it's ordinary lab and, and general equipment with software-defined radio, and they were able to use the wire. So most of these devices have, um, all the ones that they're making now, have a wireless component. Um, and it's the way that they communicate with the devices, which is very useful because you want to have a way to be able to adjust the software and adjust the settings of the device without having to go undergo surgery. It wouldn't really make very much sense if you know, you know, you wanted to change somebody's pulse, um, you know, by five beats per minute, and you had to cut them open. It just wouldn't be practical. So, um, so there's a wireless component to um, to most of the devices that they're actually all of the pacemakers that they're making right now. And so what they did was they implanted one of these pacemakers in a lump of meat to simulate what it would be like in a human body. And then they, they went at it, and they were able to, they, they found that the transmissions were actually not encrypted. 
So <laughs> they were able to talk to the device. They were able to deliver shocks. They were able, to, you know, just for no reason. They were able to uh, um, disable pacing functionality. They were also able to get, uh, they were also able to put it into test mode. And um, if anybody here is familiar with, um, with pacemakers, when the battery runs down, that's it. It's no good. Like you basically, these devices are only as good as their battery life. So if your battery runs down, your pacemaker, you've got to undergo surgery. And for that, uh, at least for me, it was cutting the, you know, my muscle, putting the pacemaker in and then sewing me, my, me back up. It's not like a trivial kind of operation. It's not like just shoving it in there and, <laughs> you know, just a little cut on the skin. It's, it, I was out of commission for a little while after the, the operation. It took a while to get comfortable with it. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a serious operation. And they were able to put the device into test mode, which could run down the battery very, very quickly. So it, it was a real problem. But on top of that, they were also able to get information about the patients off of the, the device that was broadcasting. So they were able to get patients' names and social security numbers. It was really crazy. And um, happily, the paper was great, and the New York Times picked it up. And my doctor saw it, and I was able to talk to him about it. And he was very understanding and helped me brainstorm. And so he found a device for me. It was actually his idea. He said, well, hang on. You know, you have a pretty simple condition. You don't need pacing therapy. You only really need a you know, defibrillator functionality in case there's sudden death. So you know, why don't we just get you an old device? So he called around and he found a device that was no longer being put, you know, people weren't recommending that device anymore because it was old, but it has no wireless functionality, which for me made me feel a whole lot safer. I mean, I didn't want to be walking around broadcasting, A, broadcasting all that information about me, but B, walking around with known vulnerabilities in my body where someone could deliver shocks unexpectedly um, and, and, you know, be in the next room or, you know, behind this wall or under a table or behind a bush. I, Scary stuff just to think about. So I have a device, um, and I got it, and I've been pretty happy with it from a, a life perspective. But I swore to myself that I would, I would look into this issue, and I would research it, and I would talk about it, and I would point it out. So now I am an author. So this week, the Software Freedom Law Center um, published an article about free software on medical devices. And um, what we did was we, t we pulled together all the different um, research that's out there on, um, on software security and on medical device failures, and we put them in one place. And you know, while it's all research that's been existing, nobody's pulled it all together to talk about why auditable software is so much safer on, um, on medical devices. So I encourage you all to check it out. Um, one of the basic premises that we talk about in the article is that software has bugs. I think everybody here in this room, <laughs> somebody's shaking his head in the back. My code doesn't have any bugs in it, um, <laughs> but um, but all software has bugs. So um, you know, the idea that you can have um, a piece of equipment that's life critical that you know that isn't made publicly available for people to study, especially you know when you're asking people to literally put it inside them, it's you know, it's it's unreasonable to me. So we we flesh out this point in the in the paper because I think that medical professionals and medical industry people don't necessarily see things from our perspective. So just to give you an idea of some of the numbers involved here, um, in 2008 there were 350,000 pacemakers. This is just in one year in the United States. Um, pacemakers were installed at 140,000 ICDs. I mean that's a that's a lot of, of heart devices. And that's not counting insulin pumps and um, chemotherapy delivering devices and pain management devices. So there are a lot of people who have these devices. And we rely on the, um, the device manufacturers to make them and the FTA to review, um, to review the safety of those devices once they're made. The software um, uh, engineering institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, there's a bug. Um, when you think about the number of lines of code it takes to run something like a heart device, you know, even if a majority of, of codes are fixed, that leaves most likely there to be some bugs behind. So um, I was pretty amazed by that number. I, when I thought about it, it made perfect sense, but seeing the number, it, it, was, it was a bit jarring. Um, and then we looked at lots of studies that examined the failures of, um, of these devices and what kinds they were. The way that the 
FDA requires for companies to report their devices and the information that is revealed um, to the public doesn't necessarily categorize the failures as software failures. So it's a little hard to take a look at it and to know exactly what it is that you know, that went wrong. But there was one study that looked at, um, at the failures of these devices. And of the ones that they were able to, so the, the, the set gets a little bit narrower, but of the, of the failures that they were able to identify as software errors, and the ones that had enough information to analyze what the error was, was in fact, 98% of them would have been detected with all pairs testing. So it's really alarming when you think about it. Um, you know, I'm sure, I, I know from my research with the FDA that they require um, a lot of testing to be done, and we'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, if, if I knew I was getting a pacemaker and I was a developer, I would run a lot of tests on the code if it were publicly available. A lot of medical think tanks would. You wouldn't have the, um, the Medical Device Security Center trying to hack into the devices. You'd have them running rigorous tests on the code. Um, I mean, they would probably be trying to hack into the device anyway, because they're, they're great and worried about all sorts of issues in addition to the code security. But, um, but yeah, you'd have you know, think tanks reviewing the code. It, you know, I, this is preaching to the choir, because you're all here, so you understand why auditable and public and free and open source software is so much safer. But um, that really, really astounded me. The other thing that we talk about in our paper and try to drill down is that security through obscurity just doesn't work. Now, I think, again, everybody here is probably familiar with it, but when you start taking a look into whether that's true or not, and it's, it's a little counterintuitive to a lot of people because they feel like, oh, well, you know, if, if you make the code open, it exposes vulnerabilities. People can study it and find ways of attacking, but that's just not true. Um, basically, you, you closed source code is also equally as attacked, and making the code open means that more people are looking at it, and it means that bugs can be fixed faster. So um, the reason why we talk so much about this is that if you're new to this idea and you take a look uh, you know, at, at different papers, it's really hard to find there's conflicting research. So one of the things that we want to do is to put it all in one place and focus the discussion on medical devices so people could see that. Um, so these are things that I think um, you're all familiar with, but free and open source software, it gives users the ability to independently check out what the risks are and figure it out for themselves, um, which is kind of huge. I mean, you know, so many people get pacemakers. If, you know, 1% of them were, <laughs> were developers and took a look at the code or, you know, children of people with pacemakers or parents of people who need pacemakers, um, so even if it's the public forgetting about medical think tanks, it's kind of astounding when you think about it how much safer and how, many, how much more reviewed it could be. Plus, even though I confess it's been a long time since I've coded, um, I don't know how rigorous my review of the source code would have been had any of the medical device companies actually given it to me. But I would have been able to have assessed the risk. I would have been able to have seen basically how it was written and gotten a feel for it. I would have felt a lot safer. Um, I would have asked my friends to take a look at it. So, um, you know, that's one really important point. Um, of course, bugs get patched much more readily and much more, uh, much faster in free and open source software, and that's in part just because you're not relying on a single party. So you're not relying just on the company to fix it. You can have, you know, while I wouldn't want anyone to have access to my pacemaker defibrillator um, to make a patch themselves, I want encryption on my device. I want, you know, security protections on my device in, that, in, my device in that regard. You know, I, I, I do want people everywhere to be proposing patches that then my, my doctor, my medical technician, um, you know, the device rep, you know, reps could incorporate very quickly. So, you know, that, that's a, a, a key point. Now, when I started looking into the FDA review, I found it to be a little bit shocking. Actually, to be completely honest, the FDA, looking at what the FDA does is so difficult um, because they only, they keep some information on their website and the stuff that they keep on there is good. Um, it was very informative. But when I started looking into it, I found that, in fact, the requirements for these devices are not fixed. They're not standard requirements that the FDA imposes. The requirements are actually designed by the manufacturers. So the idea behind it is that, 
you know, every device is a little bit different. And if we had fixed standards that apply to all medical devices, there might be some things that slip through the cracks. So the FDA charges the companies with the responsibility of coming up with their own testing and their own um, judgment as to what shows that the device is working and that it is safe. But on the flip side of that, it's really scary because the company who is trying to sell this device is the one that decides whether, you know, what kinds of tests are done on it. And the FDA has a lot of back and forth. Um, people who work on these devices will tell you that, um, that it's not so easy to get approval. And then I asked the question, well, what about the software? And it turns out that the FDA almost never reviews the source code. They will, they will take reports about the source code, but they will never, ever, ever look at the source code. Well, not ever, ever. Very occasionally. There has to be something wrong. They have to get a sense that something's wrong. There has to be a known failure, or they have some suspicion that something is going on. And, and that's just crazy to me. Um, worse still, they don't even require that the companies provide the source code. So there's no, I mean, as far as I know, there's no public repository of the source code. So, I mean, in my mind, I think if there's catastrophic failure at a company and we're trusting that company to keep good records and to keep the source code and to keep it in a way that we can use it should something happen. But should something happen, nobody else has a legitimate copy of that source code. It's all proprietary software that they probably weren't supposed to have. So it's really scary to me thinking that, well, even in a worst case scenario, even the FDA doesn't keep a copy, even if they don't publicize it. But when I said that I'm having a really hard time finding out what's happening with the FDA, I really wanted to find out what that back and forth was, what, you know, wh how, how much the, the FDA questions what the manufacturers come up with. So I filed a FOIA request. Uh, Freedom of Information Act request. And uh, all well and good, we got the notice within 20 days that they had, um, they had received the request and they would be getting back to me with their responses. Great, awesome. Then I get notification that our request is a complicated one. So we got in the queue and we were 200 or something like that in the queue for complicated requests. I'm still waiting. That was a year ago. I'm still waiting. I've had this device for a couple of years now. How many more years will I have it? I don't know, but basically on my projection of how long I've waited, I'm going to wait a lot longer before I get an answer to my FOIA request. So I filed another one, which I thought was a much simpler one, um, just asking for the approval package. Still haven't heard back on that. So it's this crazy situation where the information is supposedly public, but by the time we get it, the devices, you know, no one's actually getting my device anymore. People who are getting pacemakers now are getting, you know, are getting newer ones, even the ones that were um, that were being implanted, you know, not the old one that I got, but even the devices that were being implanted at the time that I got mine are no longer getting that device. So it's this weird, you know, situation where these devices are being phased out and there's just no information on the market. And then perhaps the craziest thing that I found out <laughs> in my research is that, um, is that there's a, a, there was a Supreme Court case in 2008 called Regal v. Medtronic. And that case basically said, oh, well, these devices had pre-market approval from the FDA, so they were approved by the FDA, and the FDA is a federal agency, and that preempts state law. And state law is product liability tort law that we're talking about here. So you can't actually sue a device manufacturer under state law for product liability. You can't bring a torts case, um, which is crazy because to me that's you know, one of the basic ways that we have checks and balances on these devices. So, or on, on, on healthcare generally. So, um, Regal v. Medtronic changed the landscape. There are a lot of consumer groups that are protection groups that are out there trying to advocate for legislation to, to, to overturn uh, or that would, would change the, the, uh, the landscape for Regal v. Medtronic. But um, right now, this is, is still the law. So, um, this coupled with the fact that the software is, is proprietary and closed um, just um, creates this crazy situation. So I'm a lawyer, I'm an activist, I'm a patient, but I'm also a citizen. This scares the hell out of me. You know, how many people have these devices and, you know, we rely on their functionality. Not only that, how many really important politicians, right? I mean, I actually almost put, um, put underneath this, there is a real threat. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, how many important politicians actually have these devices quite a lot. So when I was talking to my doctors and they said, you're just being a conspiracy theorist. Why would you think that anyone would be interested in disabling your device? That's crazy. Who would do it? And the answer is, 
I, I mean, I have no idea, but I shouldn't have to think about that because there are tons of famous people that have them who someone might want to take out. And, you know, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was really, really crazy to me just uh, the way that the doctors just couldn't understand that this was a real issue. So Dick Cheney um, also has a pacemaker. I hear he's getting this fabulous new device, but will make him actually not have a pulse, which is a really uh, interesting Interesting thing, but um, but, but a, lot, a lot of us rely on these devices. So um, I'm a citizen. I, I care deeply about about our our society critical and for me especially life critical devices. But I'm also a daughter. My father, since I've gotten my pacemaker, my father has also gotten a pacemaker, um, proving the proposition that. Cyborg parents have cyborg children, but not necessarily in that order. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm a daughter, and I care deeply about my father's health care. My uncle has a pacemaker. I have a friend with an implantable insulin pump, implanted insulin pump. You know, these things are, are, are a part of our everyday lives. It's not something that is hypothetical. It's not something that happens to a very small subset of our population. This is a real issue affecting a lot of people. Um, this is my dad. He's got a pacemaker. Um, he's also an engineer and a, a Fortran developer, too, and he, uh, he probably would have had a really good time looking at the source code in his heart. So, yeah, so this is the paper that we published, Killed by Code, Software Transparency and Implantable Medical Devices. I didn't want to get too deeply into a lot of the research because it's kind of boring to talk about, you know, in this kind of setting, but take a look at it. It's, um, it's, it's really amazing to me having collected it all in one place. And... Um, SFLC is a charity. We take donations, and the paper is available on our website, which is softwarefreedom.org. Um, and the um, the license of this talk is a CC no derivatives. So um, feel free to to um, include it elsewhere. And if you need any help as a developer for, un for free and open source software, you can email help at softwarefreedom.org. Thank you. And I've got. Like 10 minutes for questions, so yes. Well, it's actually a comment rather than a question. One of the even crazier things about the FDA and device regulation is that there's actually an incentive against companies fixing bugs in the software because if you update the software or fix bugs, you potentially have to go for recertification, which yep. means that you may now be spending thousands more dollars on top of everything just to. It's true, but that said, the um, the approvals for for just amendments to existing devices are much. It's a much less rigorous process than um, than proposing a new device. But yeah, there there is a process. Also, don't forget the fact that you know they may want to sell more devices. Um, I'd like to think that the company that produces medical devices wants to make high quality devices that can be used um, for a long time. You know, but they also do rely on selling devices and you know trusting any one company to regulate themselves is really tough. So. I have a question about assumptions. I, I, I put this in the context I'm fairly new. There are a lot of source. assumptions in, my, um, in well, this talk, but less in the paper. Yeah, <laughs> the, the assumption for most people, I think, is that, well, these devices have been tested, and developers have debugged them, and they're safe. Yeah. And your research and experience has proven this should not Well, they do fail. That, so this is not a good assumption. Your assumption is, as I hear it, that if you make the open source, you know, you put this out in the open source community, that a lot of programmers are going to be looking at that and, and checking it. And is that a valid assumption? You know, I, mean, how does that happen? I think that I think you're right about to to focus on assumptions because I think one of the things that I, I'm I'm not saying here that auditable source code will cause there to be no software failures. Um, I think these devices will probably fail, and as more and more people get them and software is a more and more critical component of these devices, we'll see more failures in this way. Um, I do think that if the source code is auditable, I, I don't think it's that outrageous of an assumption to think that people will look at it. I think individuals like me probably would, but also I think organizations like uh, medical think tanks and stuff like that would take a look at it. So I, I, I actually don't think it's, it's too big of a leap to say that people will look at the source code. Plus, there are some tests that can be run on, on source code um, in a pretty low weight kind of way, and um, you know, people would do that as well. So, and and also, if there were a failure, people would be looking at the source code in a heartbeat, um, literally. <laughs> but 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 they would be in that, and, and you know, that would help as well. They would be able to post patches that the device company could look at and say, oh, okay, we can move that much faster because somebody's already done all the work. Yes. 
Are all the uh, new devices RF uh, accessible? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I do know that all of them have a wireless component, um, but I don't know about about whether they're RF accessible. And then a follow-up, can you, do you have any idea why the devices aren't encrypted? Um, yes, the reason, or at least the reason why the device manufacturers say they're not encrypted is because um, using encryption would, um, would exhaust the battery. So basically they say we'd have more processing time. So, you know, we, you know, we want to be careful. We want to limit the things that the device is doing because if it has to worry about um, about dealing with encryption every time somebody talks to it or tries to talk to it, that will mean that the battery life will be a lot a lot shorter. So that's what they say is the is the problem. But in fact, there are all these kinds of ways to to introduce um, um, defenses that are that are, are, are you know that that don't drain the battery and um, and and that still provides some defense. So. Um, you had a question before. Yeah, is the FDA even, even allowed to have the source code under trade secret law? Um, yes. I mean, the, the FDA is able to ask for all of the specs and um, whatever they think is safe. And they do ask for the source code whenever they suspect there's a real defect. Uh, uh, they don't ask for it at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I am, uh, for years, have been making the argument that free software and the health domain is an extremely difficult argument to argue against. And in fact, as soon as you make the argument, you see that it's extremely difficult to argue against. And metal devices are probably the most extreme and relevant case. And I think it's awesome that someone who has one is making that argument. So thank you very much. I actually run a site, uh, which is down now, so you can get it up so people could look at it, called gplmedicine.org, where I argue that really the GPL family of licenses is the only license that we should be using this and for all the reasons that, you know, all the reasons that I think you're kind of getting into. I think there's a class of software that's very similar to what you're talking about. And actually, I wanted to point out two other examples to you. One is PAC software, which is medical imaging software. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I think uh, because of, uh, because of uh, there's a, a vibrant community of open source projects in healthcare software, but there's one class that so far has resisted, one class of software which has resisted you know, the, the, the free software <coughs> freedom approach. And, and that has been. Uh, cases where there's an extremely expensive approval process associated with the government that the software has to be included in. And the reason is that there's uh, this expensive process implicitly favors a proprietary model where you're guaranteed to make your money back um, and disfavors software freedom. So, and, and of course, the other side of that coin is that, and of course the problem with proprietary software is that you have a guarantee to make the money back so from a socioeconomic note, wow. so on, it's a longer argument. Okay. So, um, so for instance, the complexity of the software device that, that is in a pacemaker, the complexity of the whole device is actually relatively low. So if there was GPL software for these medical devices available, you would have the low cost startup thing happening where people start to make medical devices that were much less expensive than they are. I mean, do you know actually how much the device cost that's inside you? Is it a couple yes. thousand, right? I mean, it's not. Oh, yeah, it, it's tens of thousands. Yeah, it's, so it's, uh, it's, it's over a $50,000 device. I've heard different quotes. So, so yeah, um, I mean, it, so I can't I, find a quote that's put yeah. in the I saw, I saw one place where it referred to it as a, as a $90,000. But equipment. from a technology standpoint, yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of internal bling, somebody called yes, it on the, exactly. on the pacemaker <laughs> sites. So, I mean, but if you actually think of the complexity of the device, a cell phone that you can get from $5 in the third world is far more complex in terms of the actual technology. So if this is a case where proprietary software and the proprietary funding model is actually making healthcare vastly more expensive, and I think that's the, the heart of the problem that I'm facing in, in the medical device area, and in these other areas that actually have the similar mechanism, yeah. is that it's, a, it's, it's a, you follow the money. Yeah. I think that actually the argument that proprietary software on these devices is a critical part of the business model, is, is it's just not tenable uh, for these devices. I mean, we, <laughs> we go to these device manufacturers because we need precision equipment in this instance. Uh, we want someone who has a long history of making really good devices. There are a lot of tiny parts that have to work together. Absolutely, we want someone who has a good, a good safety record. We want um, doctors will only go with a medical device company that has the proper support for them. 
and uh, Medtronic is one of the largest, and, um, and every doctor I talk to basically said, you got to get a Medtronic device. And the reason is that when something's wrong, they're on the phone right away to the doctors telling them about it and supporting them and letting them understand. I mean, not necessarily when they ask about free software on the, or, or auditable software on the devices, but, um, but uh, for known problems. And so, you know, the, what, the way in which these companies have, have a successful business model has nothing to do with their proprietary software. So it's like this weird, peculiar situation where, um, you know, we take it for granted that companies should be entitled to have proprietary software as part of their business model, which is a, you know, a fallacy in and of itself. But on top of that, it's actually not a critical part of, of, of their business model as I can see it. So, No, I agree with you. I was just wondering, how, how do we combat that? Yeah, I what mean... What do we do now? I mean, you know. Well, I think first we, we talk about it. We, we show how unsafe these devices are. We talk to our doctors. We talk to other patients. You know, we, we, we talk to our politicians. We... we, we right. Yeah, we write, a, we write a paper and we publish it. So, you know, I mean, we, we, we do what we normally do when we're trying to, trying to advocate for social change. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of approvals, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that sort of any uh, FDA approval process in any clinical trial, there are going to be some people who respond poorly. And that's because biology is sort of a difficult thing. Medicine is an imp imperfect science. Uh, to what extent do you think medical device software defects are like a fixable problem that's been overlooked just because you expect there to be some failures in trials and can, are there steps you can take to convince the FDA that, that software defects are, are much easier to fix than sort of biological defects? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, wanna, I, want us, I want us to avoid the situation where we're having a lot of catastrophic failure on these devices due to software. Um, surely, if we have a lot of a lot of people dying due to faulty code on their devices, you know, there will be some some change. So I, you know, I, I don't really have a good answer for you because I'm I'm not sure what what it would take to 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 show that the soft, the software needs to be safer. Um, one of the things that we do in our paper is we talk about um, quite a number of software failures and show that um, that that they were due to basic software um, defects and. Chances are, if they had been um, open to the public, maybe they would have been caught. Can't guarantee it, you know. Again, free and open source software doesn't necessarily mean you know, just because it's free and open doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. But um, but in the long run, it has a much greater chance of being so. Is, um, I, I was really interested by the, the idea that the, the regulatory model sort of inhibits the ability of free software to even penetrate this market. So you, you just mentioned the, the talking and sort of having more public discussion about this is interesting. Is one of the, are, are there interesting ways um, to pro propose and explore new regulatory models that would that be a good first step in this discussion? Or are there, are there other ways to, that seem more useful to attack it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think in my personal opinion from, um, from doing all this research and also being a patient, I think that the... Um, for me, I think the first step is getting doctors really worried about the software and the devices. The doctors are the true customers of the medical device companies. They're the ones that are prescribing these devices. And if they understand that there's this whole element of safety that's not been addressed, and you know, somebody once said to me, there's no profession, perfectionist like a cardiologist. You know, if, if, if they understand that their, you know, that their devices aren't as safe because of some, you know, because the, the device manufacturers are not revealing their code, you know, I think they'll insist on it. So, you know, personally, that's where I think the, the first step is, but I think we can, we can talk about it in, in a whole host of ways. I'd like to point out that there's no such thing as a free market. There are only markets that are regulated by government and markets that are regulated by customers. So if you've got a pacemaker in your body, Whose regulation are you more? You think will be more, uh, more likely to give you the source code, your regulation, or the FDA's regulation? Well, I personally want both. I mean, if the FDA is is charged with the safety of these devices, I want them actually looking at the source code in them. Um, you know, just if just to see that they're that the, the code is written properly. Um, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily advocating for it. For, you know, the, the FDA, in part, doesn't have the resources right now to be able to do that um, from my discussions with people at the FDA. But I think we can have it both ways. I think we can have the FDA require the source code, and I think also we can have the source code public so that everybody can look at it. You have the rest of your life to look at the source code. I certainly hope so. Well, I certainly have the rest of my life to, I hope that life is long enough that I have opportunities that's, to that's, do so. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, given, given the fact that docs often have leeway 
with uh, treatments that they are able to, um, to, to institute. Do you see any room for something where you know the, the, the device itself is open source, much like the Arduino, where you've got the hardware and the software? Open I think so it absolutely should be. Open I mean, sourced I in a way that the doc can then choose how to put it together and it's not regulated because it's like components, right? Oh, well, having it be you know open and reviewable and having yeah, doctors that's... personally, I, not every cardiologist or electrophysiologist is the kind of person who I would want to trust putting together my, my pacemaker defibrillator. You know, they're really smart people, and um, some of them are excellent surgeons, and some of them are great tinkerers, too. Um, you know, I'd want to choose who I'd have the ability to do that. I, I think that that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole different line of the argument, and I'm, I'm with you on it. I just, um, I just think that um, the first step is focusing on, on making the so software auditable. I also think that the, the design specs of the hardware in, in, in a very detailed fashion should be available for inspection as well. So. Uh, although I'd love to see the software be actually free software and open source, mm -hmm. these all sound like arguments for visible, auditable software. I'm focusing on auditable for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that some regulatory structures don't don't necessarily even permit modifiable software. So, you know, focusing on auditable is just um, it's just a first step. It's just focusing on a very basic safety issue and coming at it from perspective of a patient. I, I agree with you, it should be free and open source software, but the fact that it's not auditable is just crazy. And the fact that there's no repository where the software is being kept in for safekeeping is crazy to me, too. Well, I'm just saying, I don't see any argument beyond the auditability. Like, if making it visible is a no-brainer, but why, what argument do we have to make it open source? Yeah, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to necessarily get that into that in this talk, but, um, but no, but you can make a really good argument for it. I mean, it's my body. I should be able to modify it however I want. Um, if I'm given a prosthetic leg, I should be able to improve it. I think you Congress has, would take issue with that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, again, I'm not focusing on these concepts with this paper, but you know, I, it's, it's my body I should, be able, I should be able to choose. I can choose not to have a device, even though it means that I'm, I'm likely to die. Um, I can choose to refuse medical care, and in that same way, I should be able to choose which, which device and how it's run and, you know, what software is on it as well. So, there's another question here. Uh, just, a, just a comment. Uh, uh, I feel like we're in the military, they have entire cancer security structures up around approving software and steering this and it's a you know, cryptography kind of thing. It's not good to do a lot of uh, checking of. Um, Checking of software source code at a higher level of software assurance and things like that. So I don't look at it. It's nowhere near perfect, but there, there is some, some thought you have there based on more tools on that, that line. Um, I think we are, um, we are out of time, but I, I will stay here and answer questions. Um, so I'm sorry, there were a few people who had questions still, so come up and talk to me. Thank you so much for listening to the talk and check out the paper. Thank you.